Thank you for joining us this week. I'm your host, Candace, and today I'm joined by Jarez. Hello to you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. This week, we're doing a special episode featuring our favorite video game reviews from the last few months. They've all been courtesy of Jarez. I've had a real blast putting them all together. But before we get to that, let's thank our sponsors, Lawrence Tech and Hungry Howie's. Thank you, Jarez. Now, let's start the show. Assassin's Creed Valhalla came out November 10th, the other big release of late 2020. Valhalla is the Viking fantasy that so many gamers have been waiting for. I played this game pretty much up until Cyberpunk came out, and even after it came out, the game launches a considerably more solid foundation than Cyberpunk, coming in with a few graphical bugs, sure, but anything game-breaking was pretty much patched out. But don't let that fool you, the game looks and sounds beautiful. You play as Eivor, as you and your family leave the tumultuous lands of Norway, you decide to head to England to stake out land and start your own kingdom, with the freedom to do so in whatever way pleases you. England is grand and ripe for the taking, and you and your crew find a nice hamlet for yourselves. From there you make alliances and take on more regions. You can actually upgrade the village into a bustling town and even eventually into a city. As well as go hunting, bring back supplies for rewards and just to help the town. Not to mention building supplies from, of course, raiding the local villages. While the last two games in the franchise, Origins and Odyssey, were definitely fun, they felt like quite a big departure from the original series. Moving away from one-hit counters and assassinations and parkour to a more Dark Souls-style combat and more focus on exploration than the bustling cities and the flashy verticality that fans adored. Valhalla compromises a lot of these missing elements from the old game beautifully. Beautiful sprawling environments between swamps, pastures, mountains, and more. We got big cities back and with them big buildings to climb. Verticality is back and it actually feels like parkour in this game. The way you ascend, descend, and vault over things. However, it's not as complete as Assassin's Creed Unity, but hey, I don't think the Vikings were focused on doing fancy tricks while climbing. A more refined combat system from Odyssey with weightier hits, full customization of fighting style. You can go from classic two hand axes to hand axe and shield and a dagger to a large battle axe to even two giant axes or even two giant swords. It gets pretty nutty because it even changes the way you fight and dodge. Moving away from getting random weapons and armor, they've adopted getting specific gear throughout the map that you hold on to and can decide to upgrade and use at your leisure without the annoyance of having to micromanage all that gear. You now get a huge array of perks and upgrades split into bear for war, raven for stealth, and wolf for hunting and archery. Abilities are now things you find in tomes around the map and earn from quests and rewards. You'll recognize a few of them in the last games, but my personal favorite is Rush and Bash, because there's nothing more satisfying than slamming someone to a wall or throwing them off the edge of a map. Finally, while the Assassin's storyline does take a bit of a backseat here, they found a really awesome way of implementing it with these uh, targets throughout the map, and you can use clues and interrogations to find them. Overall, the game gives me a real feeling of wanderlust, and has so much content and things to explore that it'll keep you coming back. The story is compelling, and really feels like you affect the historical characters that are involved. This game gets a huge thumbs up from me, I highly suggest it, so grab your hand axes, spears, and shields, and get cracking. Hey guys, this is Horace. welcome back to another review. Today, we're going to be looking at a game that's pretty much Counter-Strike, but injected with a little bit of Overwatch. Valorant was released on June 2nd of 2020, and was really well received. With betas and alphas coming up before, the hype was definitely built up before launch, and it was pretty well deserved. What we've got is one of the cleanest CSGO-esque games in a long time. The game's aesthetics are incredible. The menu and the general layout feel modern and futuristic with bright neon colors that pop out and are super vibrant. The music is the perfect gritty techno rock rap mix that gets you pumped up before every match in the game. The gameplay is a lot like Counter-Strike in that every round you get money to buy weapons, grenades, armor, etc. before a match. 13 rounds, one team rushes, plants a bomb at two sites, or a team defends or defuses the bombs. Killing the whole team ends the round. Pretty straightforward stuff, but there are other games that offer shorter versions. The skill curve is very steep. For anyone who hasn't played any of the Counter-Strike games, your shots have to be spot on. Every single gun has its own firing spray. Shooting while moving reduces accuracy, so walking or standing or crouching is probably the best way to do it, but obviously you're more easy to be shot. 
The game does a good job of putting that stress on, as even a single well-placed bullet can end you. So you're forced to think strategically before even entering a firefight that you see or hear. Mix into this, every operative has their own abilities. Taking a page out of Overwatch's book, but a little bit more subdued, every character has a power they can use in the fight, from throwing up a flame wall, to a bubble of wind where you can't be seen, or even throwing up a camera to check on a spot on the map for you. There's also ultimate abilities, which rack up from kills, deaths, and resources on the map. The powers push the game's strategy even further, and quick thinking is really needed, but without being too overpowered or messing up the pace of the game. Valorant is a challenging and a fantastic addition to the competitive gaming scene. I can't wait to see what the pros are able to do in future tournaments. From what I've seen on Twitch, it's some pretty crazy stuff. The game is free, so there really is no reason not to get it, but a friendly warning from me to you, have fun, but get ready, because you'll need to get good for this one, gang. Lock onto that target, do a barrel roll, and keep a hand on that hyperdrive. This isn't pod racing. Welcome to Star Wars Squadrons. Dropping on October 1st of 2020, many fans were excited to get their hands on the newest dogfighting starfighter simulator, as the last one they got was Star Wars TIE Fighter and Star Wars X-Wing back in the 1990s. With some amazing visuals and nods to fans who know a bit more about the lore, the game launched with quite a big player base. The game does support VR and joystick controls if you have one. Right off the bat, you get to customize your pilot, both pilots in fact, one from the Empire and one from the New Republic. Nothing too crazy here, mostly pick a face, body type, and some voice lines. But you do get currency with which you can customize each pilot with jackets, helmets, gloves, you name it. You get to choose between a story mode which starts with a prologue, uh, kind of a tutorial, or you can jump right into the multiplayer. If you're coming to the game for the first time, I would definitely suggest starting with the story mode. It almost acts as a tutorial and gives you some more advanced tips for each type of starfighter you can play. The overall story isn't too bad, but it's not really nothing to write home about either. It's more of a means to an end, but like any Star Wars film, it's just enough justification that the action definitely feels rewarding. You take two roles of a pilot on both sides of the war, often end up fighting in the same battles, and in this regard, I believe it was a smart move, as you really get to see both sides and how every character on both sides is affected by this war. In multiplayer, you have dogfights, 5v5, high intensity matches, usually on smaller maps with plenty to duck behind for cover or crash into if you're like me. Then there's the large fleet battles where it's still 5v5 but you get a whole army of AI fighting with and against you, fighting to take down large support ships and eventually the enemy cruiser. Gameplay feels pretty great. The controls are snappy, respond well, and really convey you hurtling through space and the maneuverability of these ships. The added challenge is that in all the ships you can switch between modes to put your energy into engines, weapons, and shields. Doing this will boost each function in that moment, so if you're going on a strafing run you can charge your shields, swap to weapons so you can fire off a bunch of shots, and then switch to maneuverability so you can quickly get out of there if need be. Not to mention a whole array of weapons, engine replacements, tools, and other upgrades you can swap out on each ship. Each ship is unique and has a very different play style, and has a lot of different benefits and losses. The graphics in the game look pretty fantastic, facing away from the sun, the illumination of laser fire lighting up the inside of what most of the time looks like very fragile ships on the inside is truly something to behold. The maps vary from amazing Jupiter-like gas planets to beautiful starry dust clouds to the debris-strewn graveyards of past battles. It really immerses you in the world, especially with a recognizable and much more punchy sound design the laser fire and in-game combat. The graphical limitations of the faces probably could be a bit better, but that's just me being nitpicky. If you've been looking for some kind of dogfighter in space, I'm happy to say that this game scratches that itch. Whether you're looking for a quick, fun story, or just want to get into large laser fights in some amazing looking locales with friends, this game is for you, especially considering that it does have crossplay functionality. Definitely check this game out, especially if you're a Star Wars fan. I promise you'll enjoy it. Hitman 3 is one of the first AAA games to come out in 2021 on January 20th. Releasing as a finale to the reboot series, the game definitely is a spectacular finish. While being labeled as a sequel, it acts really more like an expansion, as the gameplay is the same as the first two games, um, but the graphics have gotten a bit of a touch-up. It acts like a package game where if you've played either of the first two games, the story and the maps do carry over, but if you don't, you can always get the whole series within Hitman 3 for about $20 up, which is not a bad deal for all three games. If you haven't played the original two, you follow Agent 47, one of the best assassins for the ICA, 
a contract company that takes out high profile targets, whether by classic gunning down or making it look more like an accident. Spoilers here, but during the first two games you start getting contracts from a shadow client. And you learn that all the contracts are against this secret organization, think like the Illuminati, named Providence. Uh, a lot of back and forth happens, double agents, triple agents, so on and so forth. The story can definitely get a bit convoluted, but does a really good job of tying into every element of the gameplay. Not to mention, this new third game really wraps everything up quite nicely. IO has really staked its claim on the modern stealth genre. The gameplay always has this fantastic slow burn, locating the target, exploring the area for ways to make the hit happen, whether that's posing as a bartender and poisoning their champagne, nailing someone with a shovel as a team mascot, or even cracking someone with a coconut. The creativity and endless options really put the player in the driver's seat and really helps them feel like they really are the ones pulling the strings on how it's going to go down. Whether it's through sneaking around and getting disguises and finishing them off that way or just straight up having a shootout, it's really up to you. This is further pushed with how fantastic the maps are. There's about six total, not including the maps from the last two games, and these maps I'd say are probably the best in the series. Huge, plain to explore, so many opportunities and crazy ways to get close to the target. Crazy design like the tallest building in Dubai, underground clubs in Germany, and a neon-filled city in China. Whether it's posing as a detective solving a rich family's murder to only get close and then murder the family head, yeah, pretty ironic. Or posing as a volunteer in a shady science experiment to get close to your contract, the disguises and what you can do with them get pretty wacky. Not to mention the replayability. Side missions in these maps and online features called online contracts. You and other players can go to any of these maps, select up to four contracts, choose a desired way of completing it, weapon, outfit, and submit it online. You can then play these contracts using hidden entryways and new weapons you can pick up from when you play the story mode. This creates what feels like a whole new set of contracts and a bunch of new ways to experiment with the game's wild, creative maps. If there's one thing I've learned from playing this game, is that Hitman is the king of the modern stealth genre. And this last game not only cleans up the entire story extremely well, but really is the best of the bunch. I was really excited for this one, guys. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the game, the complete edition, came out on January 14th to ecstatic and nostalgic fans like myself. I used to play this game all the time with my siblings back on the PS3. So to see a report was coming out, I could not wait. For anyone who didn't play the first game, the game is based off of the movie and the comic Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, taking place in the land of Poutine and Moose, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. The story follows Scott Pilgrim, a rough and tumble type dude fighting people, living his life until he meets Ramona Flowers. They fall in love, but he can't date her until he defeats her seven evil exes. What follows is a hilarious, heavily video game inspired adventure with some touching moments. The game follows this, leaning more towards the comic, which it does vary slightly, but it's not afraid to take some liberties like fighting zombies and an anti-Scott and even a giant mech. You can choose between a whole cast of characters including two new ones, Knives and Wallace, that all level up individually. The controls line up with most fighting games, like Double Dragon or Streets of Rage, movement, a light attack, heavy attack, guard, super, and assist buttons. The lights and the heavies can be mixed up, but you can unlock some pretty flashy combos as you level up with XP from beating baddies and finishing levels. You fight through each level, inspired by areas in the source material, and you usually fight a big boss, one of the evil exes, at the end. Combat is fun, but definitely challenging. Large crowds and big health pools for enemies make for some pretty tough fights, which makes it even more satisfying when you beat them. The combat can be a bit clunky, however. Some attacks miss or can bug out, which results in you getting wailed on by a crowd. I played through this when I was a kid with my siblings and currently as you're seeing with my friend. It's really fun, but sometimes really feels needed as some of the later levels can be really challenging on their own. But there's something super satisfying about you and up to three other buddies juggling a boss that's supposed to be hard. The reboot stays pretty loyal to the game, not changing anything. Unfortunately, that also applies to original bugs and issues. Occasional crashes after KOing bosses, crashes in Ubisoft server when playing online, and as you can see here, my friend and I getting softlocked on the stage. We weren't able to progress, so we had to wipe out all of our lives just to get a rerun in. It also adds some new game modes, boss rush, battle royale, survival horror, and dodgeball. They're nothing really to write home about, but they're fun additions to play once you've knocked out the story. 
The pixel-based visuals and loads of video game references really drive the nostalgia factor while playing it. With smooth animation, retro pixel art style, and some truly fantastic level designs, this is great on the eyes of returning fans and even new ones. And the music. Oh man, the music. An original chiptune soundtrack by Anamanaguchi really drives home that gamer feel. From arcade blasting music to pixelated alternative rock, the original soundtrack has a little bit for everyone. I could gush on and on about this game, but let me just summarize by saying this game will be just like how old fans remember it and has plenty for the new fans to love. While there are a few troublesome issues, they don't pop up often enough to really spoil the fun. This classic is a must buy in my book. God's Will Fall is an action adventure game developed by Clever Bean Studio. It released on all current consoles and PC. The story follows a group of humans hunting down the gods that have terrorized them for many years in strange new lands. After the intro cutscene, loosely explaining the story with some fantastic artwork, you show up on the shore of this island with eight different warriors from different clans. Each has its own random weapons, skills, and even relationships with others that can give them bonuses. For example, if one character was saved by another, they'll get bonuses to save the other. Or, if a warrior's had a dream about dying in that dungeon, they do get negative bonuses going in. However, if they beat the dungeon, they get permanent buffs for overcoming the challenge. This back and forth between relationships, world events, and relations with the gods really makes each warrior feel like an individual and have their own weight and playstyle. Each warrior also has a backstory that you can look at that also sums up whatever has happened to them most recently. The island acts as a hub world. Your group can travel through the island freely, encountering dungeons and world events. The gods themselves inhabit dungeons or realms in which they rule. Followers and creatures of the gods act as enemies, and the maps make some very interesting layouts that tell a story as you play, about what kind of god you will fight. Within each run, the realm's difficulty is randomized. Killing creatures there will lower the god's total health pool, making the fight a bit easier when you get to them. The gods themselves vary from extra difficult to dying with a quick few repetitions, which can make the game feel a little bit lackluster. However, each fight is extremely unique, and how they affect the environment is always a fun challenge. There is really nothing to tell you if a level's difficulty is higher than others on each run, so you almost have to sacrifice warriors to see if it's even worth pursuing, which can definitely be frustrating. I tried it with the keyboard and the controller, and the controls are definitely more catered to the controller. Combat is pretty straightforward, each weapon has a light attack, a heavy attack, along with dodging, and it rewards aggressive style of play in which you can heal yourself for the amount of damage you've dished out. Parrying is kind of difficult starting out, but once you learn it, it makes the standard enemies pretty easy. Most attacks are hefty, and once you commit to it, you can't really dodge until the animation is done. While the graphics are a bit stylized, I feel like this strengthens the game's visuals. It gives the grotesque creatures and the body horror looking bosses more of a grungy feel, which really drives home the really unique character designs. The player characters, however, can look kind of weird sometimes, in my opinion. With a few annoyances, overall though, Gods Will Fall was a very difficult but very fun game for me. Once you get into a rhythm, you can beat the game pretty quick, so if you're looking for a relatively short but challenging game, oozing with weird imagery, I would definitely pick this one up. Valheim came out February 2nd and was developed by Iron Gate AB. It's a survival adventure game based off Viking culture. Each new game takes place within a procedurally generated purgatory between each realm. An instant hit, almost a million players currently, according to the reports. Let's get into why. Starting a new game, you see you're being taken through misty skies by a large crow, which then drops you off in the center of a ring of stones with strange symbols and runes. A smaller crow tells you that you've passed from on from Midgard, which is Earth as we know it, and have been tasked to find these godlike creatures, hunt them, and offer them to the gods themselves. A pretty simple story, although as the game is still in early access, we might see more. I've played both myself and with friends, and one of them made a pretty solid comparison. They said the game was a lot like a combination between Minecraft and RuneScape with the combat of Dark Souls, and I couldn't have agreed better myself. The game is very stylized with its lo-fi pixelated art style. Up close you can see textures are 
pretty pixelated, but with the stylization of creatures and colors, this ends up working very well. Not to mention, despite the lo-fi look, the game is beautiful. The lighting and how well everything is generated takes it from looking like a pixel game to a truly beautiful landscape that almost seems to be fully designed by hand. Meadows, the swamps, mountains, all areas in the game look beautiful, if not haunting. Especially some currently unused areas like this one, with his giant webs and whatnot. My favorite part so far has been building a ship and traveling the seas with my friends in search of new islands and supplies. The core gameplay loop is trying to find shelter, chopping down trees, creating some kind of home while fighting off creatures at night. The game takes into account the annoyance of the durability systems, and you can repair any items at a workbench without even using any materials. Skills like jumping, running, swinging, and axe increase dependent on the frequency that you use them. However, there's no real true leveling up system. The only way to increase your health and stamina is based off one, how well rested you are, and two, three different items of food you've eaten, as you can see in the bottom left here. Finally, the combat is challenging but feels fluid and is very rewarding. Many different fighting styles, weapons change up your combo style as well, blocking speeds and even movement speeds. The enemy designs are challenging but fun and creative. Swarms of gray dwarves or skeletons charging you, giant trolls battling on the plains, werewolves in the mountains, or even a sea serpent chasing you on a voyage. Each creature and design adds new challenges and gives everyone almost a unique experience and story you can share at the campfire each night. Finally, the boss battles are large-scale tests of combat and how well you've prepared. Challenging and fun, I would definitely suggest doing this with some friends. Valheim was a surprise for me. There's been plenty of survival and survival indie games, but Valheim was able to breathe some new life into this genre. With its challenging combat, fantastic art style, and quality of life upgrades, grab it as soon as possible. Grab 10 friends and get lost in this game. This is a must have, and I can't wait to see more of the game when it gets closer to its full launch. 3D World garnering a lot of attention from pre-existing love for the original release. But we're going to be talking about the surprise bite-sized adventure that came with it, Bowser's Fury. Following the story of Mario falling into a strange cat-like world that is being terrorized by a giant Godzilla-sized Bowser. After scaring Giga Bowser, also known as God Slayer Bowser in other translations, Bowser Jr. explains about how Bowser's anger combined with this mysterious black goo has changed him into something terrifying and different. He asks Mario for help, and Mario, being the ever good Samaritan, says he will. The story is definitely interesting, but simple enough that you don't have to worry about the details too much. While you're exploring the strange archipelago known as Lake Lapcat, it can go from a fun cheery jaunt into an anxiety-ridden escape as Giga Bowser appears, usually with a bit of rain. In the distance, you'll see Giga Bowser's shell start spinning, and when he finally returns, the world becomes dark while Bowser fires spikes and fireballs from the sky while trying to roast you alive. Getting what's called a cat shine will light a lighthouse and scare him away temporarily, but he does always return. Him always coming back combined with the randomness of it creates some really fun moments when you're just enjoying yourself and then all of a sudden have to rush to find where the next cat shine is. There's also new blocks in the game which can be destroyed only by Bowser's flames which can reveal new areas and even other shines as well. Finally, once you have enough shines, you can become Giga Cat Mario and face off against Bowser like a giant Godzilla battle. When you finally beat him, it unlocks new parts of Lake Lapcat. The controls are very smooth and play a lot like Mario Odyssey. They mixed in the dash function from the older games and added new abilities like the Cat Bell from 3D World, and the ability to even switch between power-ups at will. The levels are varied, but it's not excessive, and being able to travel between these islands on the lake almost seems like a vacation. I finished the game in about 2-3 hours, 4-5 to five if you're trying to 100% the game. It's a perfect amount of Mario, and honestly, I would not be opposed to more small adventures like this from Nintendo. Bowser's Fury has some really interesting game elements and some much needed quality of life additions. Just the right amount of collectibles and visually fun to explore, Bowser's Fury is the perfect quick little adventure, definitely worth playing if you're picking up the new package game. Hellish Court released as early access on February 16th by developing company Kubel. It had a bit of hype before its launch. I know I had my eyes on it for a while. It launched into a very positive fan base, and with what the game brings to the table, I can't say I blame them. The game has a loose story taking place in 17th century Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. 
So far, the story mode really only has an intro video between some characters, but Kubold has plans for a full story mode in their release schedule. I'm looking forward to it, as so far the voice acting and the character design is really, really good. They also stated that you'll get to fight against other types of enemies, so that's pretty exciting. The game is entirely built on physics-based models, so a strike of a blade or a fist will actually cause something to fly back in response. This ends up working so well with the fighting style of the game. It's designed to be easy to start, but hard to master. Each button attacks from a different angle and can be strung together for a combo. To block, you simply don't do anything. However, it's not guaranteed. Your character will try their best, but moving out of the way is always going to be better. The game is also realistic in the sense that you could probably die with one or two swings. Just one hit in the right spot, catching your opponent off guard could potentially be instant death. Swinging wildly might have you win, but not before getting slashed across the face too, if you're not careful. The game is all about when to block, timing your swings in tandem with your enemies, and striking when the time is right. Getting a solid hit or striking it deep enough can result in some pretty brutal finishes. From finishing off someone by cutting their fighting arm, to getting them deep in the gut, slashing them across the neck or face, or even cutting off a limb or a head, Knowing you can die in one strike really pushes the strategy of the game and also the tension when you're having a difficult battle. Currently, there is a practice mode, a regular fight or survival. Personally, I play survival quite a bit. It's probably one of my favorite ones so far as it's giving you the most content. But there are plans for online fighting, but currently, if you want to play with friends, you have to set up remote play with a friend through Steam so they can play with you. Playing against random characters is a bit more of a hassle though. It involves having to download a third party app to do so which can be kind of excessive. There's quite a bit of different styles and characters with plans on releasing more in the future. Every character is designed with a culture in mind and has 3D scanned clothing put in. Hellish Court definitely has some interesting quirks and the ability to play online is limited currently. But I think it's very much a diamond in the rough. There's a lot to enjoy here, and it's not too expensive. I'd say if you're willing to play something pretty quick, especially with the patience for it to develop into something bigger, pick it up, it's not super expensive. Otherwise, keep an eye on it, and pick the game up when it's a little bit more developed, as I have a feeling it's going to be pretty big. Well, that's it for this week. It was a lot of fun having you here with me today, Horace. Thank you. It was so much fun being here, and I can't wait to do more game reviews for the show. Before we go, make sure to subscribe to our new podcast, Gamers Unlimited. And, of course, be sure to follow State Champs Esports on all social media. We'll see you next time.